He's a minister of the gospel, a teacher, a university professor, somehow manages to find time to run a museum, and he's an archaeologist. His name is Dr. Michael Hazel. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is our conversation. Dr. Michael Hazel, welcome to Conversations. Thanks for being here. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. I think a lot of people would like to talk to an archaeologist and just start asking some of those, those big questions. And I'm one of those people. But we'll get to the big questions about archaeology. That's what you do today. You're a teacher. You're a bona fide archaeologist. Actually, I ask one question first. What's an archaeologist? You have a whip and a hat and a horse and you ride around the desert. You know what I'm saying. People think Indiana Jones. What do archaeologists really do? Well, archaeology is, of course, a science. It's a, it's a discipline that really delves into the social history and the cultural history of, of the world and different civilizations. So there is a treasure hunter, I think, in all of us, but it's a, it's a very detailed, very meticulous scientific discipline with methodology, theoretical ba basis, and, and very um, takes years and years of study. Well, I'm going to ask you some questions such as what's going on in archaeology today? What are some of the great archaeological discoveries? What are, what are people searching for? What are the, the, the big exciting items that archaeologists are looking to lay their hands on? But we'll get to that. Let's talk about you first. Let's go back. Uh, tell me a little bit about you, where you're from, your background. Yeah, I actually was born here in Tennessee. And then two months later, my parents moved up to Michigan where my dad became a professor at one of our universities there. And uh, so I grew up um, in southwestern Michigan. And my dad was an Old Testament scholar. And so I grew up surrounded by books and surrounded by all kinds of uh, neat things. He was a minister as well. And one of the things that he loved to do was uh, he loved to travel. He loved photography. And he would take slides of his travels all over the world. And on Friday evenings uh, for worship, we would often see those slides. And one of my favorite things that we were able to look at and watch were slides of the Middle East. To me, that was fascinating because the Bible would kind of come to life with those images that he would show. And he would tell us about his travels to Babylon and travels to Egypt and, and these different places. And it just seemed like a, such a far away and such an exciting place. So my earliest childhood memories... I think his first trip to the Middle East was when I was three. So my earliest childhood memories are, are those pictures and those experiences that he would share with us. So is it fair to say that's where the archaeologist in you was born? I think so. He also subscribed to a magazine, a journal called Biblical Archaeology Review, which I started reading as a teenager. And then in high school, when I was 17 years of age, he had an invitation to speak at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and uh, for a large international conference uh, of Old Testament scholars. And he came to me one day, he says, would you like to come along? So that was, um, I paid for that ticket. I paid off the ticket for the rest of the summer working construction with my cousin. But uh, that was my introduction to the Middle East was traveling there with my dad. And I was just fascinated. It, was, it, it blew me away. I had been to Europe many times. My, both my parents were European immigrants. My grandparents lived in Europe. But being in the Middle East and actually walking through the streets of Jerusalem. You and I have been there. It's just an amazing, amazing experience. And it I is. think that kind of awakened in me the idea, I think I could do something like this in the future, maybe. So at some stage in your academic career as a university student, you've got to commit, I'm studying this. Yeah. When were those decisions made? I mean, the day you walked on campus, I'm here to be an archeologist, or was it a little bit later? Well, um, when I came back from that trip, I was then a senior in high school, in academy, and I went to a lecture with my dad. There was an institute of archaeology at the university where he taught, at Andrews University, and so I went to a lecture, and it was by a very famous Italian archaeologist, Giovanni Pettinato, who was from the University of Rome, and he was the decipher of the famous uh, Eblite language that was uh, these thousands of cuneiform tablets that had been found at Ebla. And he was a very exciting lecturer. He was Italian, you know, very vivacious and very 
engaging. And at the end of that lecture, I thought, man, that is so amazing to be deciphering a whole language that had been lost for thousands of years. I went and got a signature, uh, an autograph in, in a book that my father owned that he had written, The Archives of Ebla. And then afterwards, I said to my dad, I said, is there, we have a museum on this campus, don't we? He said, yeah. I said, do you think they would like a high school student to volunteer there? He says, well, there's one of the curators. Go talk to him. So I went over and talked to him. And within a week, I was volunteering. Within two months, I was hired as a student worker. And that was the beginning then as I went into university. Uh, the next year, I, I was very much wanting to pursue a combination of, of religion, biblical studies, um, theology, and archaeology. And so that's kind of the combination of what I try to put together in my academic Talk about curriculum. the intersection of theology and archaeology for a moment. Well, we have to understand that in the field of archaeology covers the entire globe, of course. So you have Mesoamerican archaeology and you have, you know, the Incas, the, the, uh, the Aztecs, the Mayans. You have European archaeology, you have Chinese archaeology, you have, you know, it covers the whole globe wherever people lived in ancient times. Um, but the real impetus and beginning of archaeology and the entire discipline of archaeology was really biblical archaeology. Uh, the Middle East was really the driving beginning force. There, were some, there was some work by some here in the United States and some in Europe, but really that was the main impetus. And so um, it has a very long history of, of being connected to the ancient Near East. And um, in our church, uh, it's been very well connected also with biblical studies. Um, so the, the field of biblical archaeology is kind of a sub-discipline within Near Eastern archaeology, we sometimes call it geographically or Syro-Palestinian archaeology. It's a subdiscipline within that where you look at the connections between the Bible and the Bible's history in these various countries uh, or empires, whether it's Babylonia, Syria, or whatnot, and, and how they intersect with, with what's happening in the Bible. Might be a very broad question, maybe too broad, but I'll ask it anyway. I wonder if you could comment on the sort of contribution archaeology has made to world thought or, or, or contemporary, a contemporary understanding of, of, of this or that. Um, maybe, the reason I ask this is maybe your average lay person like myself spends a lot of time blissfully unaware of how archaeology has impacted us on sort of a day-to-day -day basis. It, it may be something as, as simple, I don't know that one would call this archaeology, but you see the Colosseum standing there in Rome, an ancient structure, and you say, oh, wow. And that gives rise to an awful lot of understanding and, and, and cultural appreciation. What has archaeology done big picture that you can point to in two or three instances to say, look how our understanding really was benefited from these discoveries? Well, you know, we can say that history is important because without understanding history, we don't understand where we come from. Sure. And without understanding where we come from, we often don't understand where we're going. And so archaeology really contributes to that larger, bigger question of history. Before archaeology, um, we had history in terms of writing, and we had sources, Greek sources, classical sources. But archaeology really has helped us uncover tens of thousands of tablets of um, in languages that have been deciphered, like Eblite, Akkadian, Egyptian, various languages. And that's just opened up a huge world of understanding, worlds of understanding in these different cultures to help us understand the interaction of these various uh, civilizations as they've developed over time. And to also see that, you know, we often think we, we're doing things for the first time or that we've invented things for the first time. And th it's true that they didn't have smartphones probably back then. <laughs> but um, that there's nothing new really under the sun. I think Solomon said that, right? Sure. There's nothing new under the sun. And so when you go back in history and you see um, the incredible innovative um, accomplishments that were, that were done back then, whether it's architecture, whether it's language, whether it's... Um, Sci the sciences, mathematics, astronomy, um, it's actually very, very remarkable. And, you know, I look back at something like the pyramids. Um, you know, some, one of the oldest, they're the oldest structures in the world, really. I mean, they go back to the very beginning of Egyptian history. Would we have anything today that still is, is standing, you know, 4,000 years later, um, just to see the monumental kinds of 
work that went into those kinds of things and and for what to 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 really promote an ideology to promote an idea of eternal life and to ensure that that eternal life would take place for the ancient king that died um, those are those are meaningful things that still resonate with us today and we can see that a lot of those ideas in the ancient world haven't changed today they're still with us fascinating too isn't it you mentioned the pyramids i'm thinking of stonehenge so the pyramids have been standing there in full view just much longer than any of us have been same is true for Stonehenge. That's another uh, ancient cluster of, of, of monuments. But in spite of that, and in spite of uh, archaeology and history and so forth, there's still a great lack of understanding about some of this. I mean, there are discussions still today. How were the pyramids built? How in the world did they erect those stones at Stonehenge? Where did the stone come from? What was the purpose? It's interesting, isn't it, that there's still a lot of unanswered questions about some of these things that are hidden in plain view. There are. There are lots of unanswered questions. And so, you, you know, archaeology really, we can provide some answers, but we have a lot of unanswered questions as well. Uh, one of my early professors said an archaeologist needs at least two things, a great attention to detail and a vivid imagination <laughs> in order to put those things together and try to come up with ideas of what, what things were like actually in the ancient world. How difficult is it? You deal with the ancient world all the time. How difficult is it to look at something you, you, you uncover in the sand or the dirt and accurately understand what this was, where it fit in, where it plugged in? I'm certain some things just like that. But I wonder, too, if archaeologists have looked at things over the years and said this was a, and years later, a revision of that very same study. So ah, it was B, actually. Maybe later it was seen to be A, B, or, or even C. So I think archaeology, I'm, th I'm asking, not stating my thought, archaeology must be one of these sort of ever understanding or ever developing fields of science. Is that true? Of course, yeah. We, we're building on a, a building block of knowledge, and so every site that gets excavated can, can, can change the, the perspective of what's going on many times. We also deal often with hypotheses and theories that are based on what we have found at a number of sites and putting those together. And, and it, can take, um, it, it can take the one ugly fact that destroys the most elegant theory. So things can change very rapidly. An example of this is, uh, you know, the whole debate over King David sure. and the, the history of David. We had... Now, you've been um, very involved in this. And I've been very involved in this over the years. So there were a number of scholars in Israel that were arguing that, that David and his kingdom was very, very small, not very large. It was based on the absence of evidence. We didn't have a lot of evidence for a lot of sites outside of Jerusalem dating to that time period. And, uh, and then in 2007, one of those cities was uncovered. Um, by our team uh, and excavated over a course of several years through 2013. And we suddenly have a, mon a, mon uh, uh, a, um, a fortified site with, with gates, with, with massive fortifications, with storage rooms, with all the, the attributes of what one would consider a city uh, during that time period. So when cities were not supposed to exist, suddenly we have one. And that that revolutionized the discussion and revolutionized the, the, the whole debate over the early history of Judah. And today, that was 2013, now almost 10 years later, we have a number of those same type of sites in the same region and we can, that have been excavated by other teams and other archaeologists. So that data is expanding as we go along. So in archaeology, it's always good to base your your arguments on data, not the lack of data, because those things are always, always being rediscovered and, and, and being found. Fascinating from a biblical point of view. Right. You, you pass me a Bible, I say King David existed, but your colleague, your archaeological colleague might be inclined to say, slow down there a little bit, because we have a great lack of evidence for David's existence. Well, for me, I have the Bible. But for a scientist, I understand that that scientist may say, that's just not enough for me. I get that. So how monumental was the discovery of the, the, the evidence of David's existence and what now apparently archaeologically was a great kingdom? How, for me, that, that, that sounds like it just had to be about the biggest thing ever. 
What was that like in biblical archaeology? Well, in 1993, a team was excavating at the site of Tel Dan, and accidentally, um, they were working on a, on a wall of uh, a small structure outside the city gate, and um, in that wall was reused a stone, and as that stone accidentally turned over, they saw an inscription on it. That inscription actually uh, was an inscription that mentioned David for the first time in history. First that was time in history. First time in history outside of the Bible. Up to that point in time, just in the year prior to that, some biblical Old Testament scholars had argued that David didn't exist because we never found him in the archaeological record. Now, one year later, in 1993, that discovery was made, and that made headlines all over the world. That was a huge, huge thing, the House of David referring to the kingdom of Judah. And it referred to him about 140 years after his time, which means he was remembered for quite some time. Now we know that David is mentioned at least three different times in other monuments like the, uh, the Moabite stone or the, the Mesha Stila, and possibly also at the Karnak um, temple at the, on the Karnak uh, reliefs of, of Shoshank I. So we have a number of different occurrences now. So at that point, the argument shifted. We now know David existed, um, but what the Bible says about David and his kingdom being that huge, is that really, is that really um, accurate? And so that's where the, the, archeolo the archeological evidence for these various cities came in later on. So it took thousands of years to uncover archeological evidence for David. Someone might be thinking, well, what's so hard? Why couldn't you find something about David? Or why can't you just go and find? But what's the answer to that? It's all, well, the, the statement might be made, it's all hidden under the ground there somewhere. Right. Why, <clears throat> sorry for the question, why is it so hard to find some of this stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer to that is that only a, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what can be discovered has been discovered. Number one, you have to understand that um, there are hundreds of sites in the Middle East, many of which are unknown. Every time a road goes in or a large building gets built in Israel, something gets uncovered, something ask, is discovered. I want to ask you about yeah. that. I, I hate to hit the pause button, but I will. Yeah. Um, as an archaeologist, when you see a road being built or excavation taking place, they're going to build an, a skyscraper or an apartment building in, right. in, in Tel Aviv. Is there a little part of you inside that just dies? Because like, ah, oh, yeah. Or yeah. are they so careful over there that they go sifting through the rubble looking for they stuff? They will. They, they will stop any construction if there's archaeological remains. So we have a road going over Bet Shemesh, for example, right now. Bet Shemesh was the ancient site that the Ark of the Covenant came to after it was uh, captured by the Philistines. And then it arrived to Bet Shemesh. It's right on the border between Philistia and Judah. It's a thriving city today. Uh, Ace Hardware is there. That's where we buy some of our tools. Here we go. Uh, so at Bet Shemesh, they, they are, they're expanding the road. It goes right over the ancient site. So they had salvage excavations now for several years, and they've discovered a huge part of the city. Bet Shemesh has been excavated for over a couple of decades now, but they have discovered a whole nother section of the city of the 7th century that we didn't even know existed. In fact, archaeologists have been saying that Bet Shemesh was not occupied in the 7th century. This is the time period, of course, of the Babylonian conquest by Nebuchadnezzar and other, um, other figures before that time. So fascinating stuff that comes from some of these salvage excavations. Okay, I interrupted you a moment ago. We will uninterrupt in just a moment. Um, I'm loving it, and I'm sure you are as well. With Dr. Michael Hazel, I am John Bradshaw. This is our conversation. Back with more in just a moment. What does the Bible say about astrology? Why do bad things happen to good people? What color is Jesus? If you have a question, we'd love to find an answer for you from the Bible. Line up online from It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is archaeologist Dr. Michael Hazel. I asked you a moment ago about uh, why we don't find more stuff N and, and interrupted you. I want to take you back. You talked about the fraction of the fraction of the fraction of the fraction. So, so, so archaeologists are really looking for very small needles and very, very large haystacks. 
but but let me let me uh, let you proceed with that. Why 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 are we not just stumbling over nameplates with David's name on them every day? So this is what I tell my students. You you begin with you know all of these sites all over the Middle East, only a fraction of which are known. Sometimes we find it like construction wise or so, so forth. Sometimes uh, sometimes a farmer stumbles across something as he's plowing his field, and suddenly there's a site there. Um, Many of these areas are restricted. Um, many of these countries have restrictions. Sure. Uh, in the Middle East, obviously, it's a very sensitive place, so a lot of areas aren't explored. Then those places that have been excavated are only excavated to a very small extent. So even when we put, I, I think of Ashkelon, the Ashkelon excavations, Harvard University dug there from the 1980s to uh, this, this, this century and, and probably spent... Um, 30 seasons there at the site. Less than 5% of the site is excavated. Oh, no kidding. 30 seasons. And, and a huge amount of, of, of funding that went into that as well. Great, great dig. Great. Uh, I, I worked with them once, one of those seasons. It was a wonderful experience, but uh, great discoveries. Um, we found a part of, a, of an arched gateway from the Middle Bronze Age. That's the time of Joseph, around the time of Joseph, the time of the patriarchs. We thought the Romans invented the arch, and we now know that the arch goes all the way back to that period, hundreds and hundreds of years before the Romans. So that's where neat discoveries are made. Yeah. Um, but so you have a fraction of, of the site that actually is excavated. Then of that, you have only a fraction of those sites that are actually published because archaeologists love to go from site to site to site to excavate, but the years that it takes to publish all the material the millions of bits of data from that material is, is very time consuming. And then um, once you get down to that, only a fraction of that which is published actually has a direct impact on an identifying mark of the Bible of some sort. So like the David inscription or something like that. Um, and it can take years to get there. So. For instance, at Ekron, the Philistine site, I worked there for many years in the 1990s. Uh, it's one of the five Philistine cities. And Ekron, we didn't even know was Ekron. We guessed it was Ekron, but it wasn't until we got into the whole project, and it wasn't until the very last season that we found a large inscription that identified Akish, the son of Padi, the son of Yasad, the son of Yair, uh, ruler over Ekron. And for the first time, we knew that that was the site. So, so those kinds of things, inscriptions are very difficult to find. When we find them, we're very, very excited. When we find seals, when we find seal impressions, when we find those kinds of things that actually tie us back to the Bible and people in the Bible, that's, that's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes I, we need to be cautious to say, well, so-and-so hasn't been found yet. Yet is Yet. the question. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about some of these cool things that, that have been found, seals and so on. But first, I want to ask you to describe for me a day in the life, a typical day in the life of an archaeologist digging in a field. Dr. Michael Hazel, archaeologist, working a site, Lahish or someplace, tell Dan, what's an average day like? Because I... I, I think it's easy to think of archaeology as, oh, look what I found. But I expect those experiences are kind of few and far between. What's an average day like? So on our excavations that I conducted over the last decade or so, we had some of the largest projects in Israel, and we had about 120 people in the field. So well, that's it, first of all, you have... Is you that have, a lot? That's, that's, that's a lot. Yep. Um, you, have, you have volunteers. You have uh, square supervisors that are overseeing them. There are all archaeologists or archaeology students that have experience. Um, you have uh, various um, experts that are either at the site or that you have on retainer, so to speak, just in case you need them, uh, in case something is found that, that needs to be analyzed or needs to be discovered and needs to be um, looked at. Um, it's a multidisciplinary field that requires all of these different experts to weigh in because you're reconstructing everything in the past. Hmm. So you need to have geologists to deal with the geology of the site. You need to have 
architects to to look at the architecture and you need to have artists to do all the drawings uh, of, of the artifacts, photographers and, and drone pilots that can take aerial photography. I mean, um, we have a whole uh, survey team that deals with the surveying and the mapping of the site. So there's all of this that goes on. But typically, we wake up very early in the morning. We want to avoid the heat of the day. Uh -huh. We work usually in the summertime because that's when university students are off and can work. Um, and when we can work as well and are not teaching classes. So we're out usually by 5 o'clock a.m. We're in the field. We, uh, we um, usually have a brief time of, of orientation of what the goals are for that day for the team. We break up into different fields because we're working in different areas of the site. And, uh, and then we start excavating and start working very carefully. Now, sometimes we may be in a huge fill of dirt that needs to be moved through very rather quickly. And so we use large tools like picks and we call them tarias, they're kind of large hose. And, and that can move quickly. When we get down to a floor, that becomes very meticulous. That's when you think of the typical archaeology stuff like, dental tools right, and, right. and small trowels and small tools. That's when those things come out and brushes and things like that. Uh, because that's where all the goodies are, are on the floors of these, of these buildings. Um, everything needs to be photographed uh, before anything is removed. Uh, on these floors, for example, um, they sometimes need to be drawn in place. We just had, for instance, this last week, um, I got an email from, from Israel that uh, something that we uncovered in 2016, right at the beginning of the season, on the first day, in fact, it was an ivory comb, mm -hmm. you know, for your hair. All the teeth were broken off. We, we, we uncovered it at that time. But now in post-processing, we found out that that comb has a three-line inscription on it. And it's being read right now by one of our experts at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. That inscription, who knows what it says? I mean, to find an inscription on an ivory comb, that must be something something that an elite person had. Sure. That was a very rare piece. We know exactly where that comb was found because we have notes. We have careful uh, indications of where that comb was found and we can reconstruct, okay, now we found this important inscription on it. What is the original context of that comb? What period does it come from? Was it found on a floor? Was it found, in our case, unfortunately, we think it was found in a pit, which meant uh -huh. it came from an, maybe placed there from, from a later period. But all of these things need to be carefully documented because you need to know the exact find spot in order to reconstruct what period it belongs to. And this all takes time. So we have a break at 7. We call it first breakfast. We have a break at 9. We ha call it second breakfast. That's a half an hour. We have a break at 11. That's called a watermelon break where oh, we have a little bit of watermelon. That's a things. good break. That's a good break, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If that's, you like watermelon. That's yeah. popular. And we often have... Uh, Fresh grapes uh, at Lachish, we're surrounded by vineyards and we have wonderful grapes during mm. certain seasons. Uh, and then at, by one o'clock in the afternoon, we're done digging for the day. It's been an eight hour day pretty yeah, much. already. And so we go home, we have lunch uh, at, the, at the camp. We have a siesta where people sleep because they got up at 4.30. Yeah. Um, and then in the afternoon, we get up and we wash the pottery that we found that day. We wash it, we scrub it down. Um, the volunteers do that while the staff are inside the lab going through the pottery from the previous day and we're reading the pottery and dating the pottery from all of these different contexts. Thousands and thousands of pieces, broken pieces of pottery, pottery sherds are processed in that, in that and as, well as, the, as well as the objects that are found like that ivory comb. Um, and then we go into, um, yeah, that evening, once that is done, we have a lecture for the field school, the students are getting credit for this. Uh, then we have dinner fairly late. I don't like having dinner that late, but we usually have dinner around eight o'clock or so sometimes. And then pretty much after that, there's some last things that need to be done, but it's bedtime because you're yeah. getting up the next morning yeah, at five, four thirty again. Someone is hoping I will ask you why the inscription on the comb wasn't noticed right away. Ah, uh, good question. Because it was dirty and it wasn't cleaned and the the it wasn't um some of these inscriptions are so faint yeah they're they're scratched into this was scratched into oh. into incised into the ivory that it really wasn't noticed until now and 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 sometimes this is this happens um 
Sometimes we see it right out in the field and we're like, wow, this is awesome. And then sometimes it happens in post-processing many times. I said I wanted to ask you about some of the cool stuff that may or may not have been found. So what are some of the neat things, whether, whether you've been involved in, in the archaeological process or not? We've, we've spoken at other times about seals that mm -hmm. have been found in the city of David, which is very dramatic. Yes. So what, what for you are some of the real exciting things that have been found that shine a light, particularly on, on the Bible? There have been so many, and, and some of those discoveries, like we just said, are made in the field. Some of those discoveries are made way after when people are um, working in museums uh, on tablets, translating tablets that have been found in the 1800s but haven't been read, let alone published. Oh, well. There was a situation in 2007 where a scholar from the University of Vienna was working in the British Museum looking at names and uh, looked at a tablet and saw a name, Nebusarsakim. And he's like, Nebusarsakim. It was a tablet dating the 10th year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. It was a Babylonian tablet found in Babylon. And he remembered the name Nebuchadnezzar from a text in Jeremiah. Goes to Jeremiah, I believe it's Jeremiah chapter 39, sees a whole list of officials that Nebuchadnezzar left behind in Jerusalem to kind of oversee things as he took the captives back to Babylon. And one of those is Nebuchadnezzar, only he's also given a title in Jeremiah and that same title is given to the same Nebuchadnezzar on the tablet. Oh. And so Professor Michael Yursa says, I believe that's the same person. That was an exciting discovery. That's that made cool. headlines in 2007. Oh, yeah. Now that discovery was made hundred, you know, a hundred years, more than a hundred years after it was discovered in the 1800s in Babylon. Um, other discoveries are made right out in the field. Uh, we were at the site of Lachish, and we had a small, tiny little dipper juglet. And in that dipper juglet, we found uh, tiny little seals about the size of my thumbnail, maybe even smaller. And those seal impressions pressed on mud or on clay in ancient times and placed on a letter. One of those seals, we had, we had two inside the container, and then we sifted around the container because it was turned a little to its side, and we found two more in wet sifting and, and dry sifting. But two of those seals bore the name of Eliakim. And uh, we went back and did the research. We could read it right out in the field. I mean, we could read it. it we put it there. We took photographs. And, you know, it was very exciting. But in the post-processing and post-research that was done in the publication that finally came out, um, we believe that this is the same Eliakim. It dates to the right time period, as the Eliakim mentioned in Isaiah chapter 37, the head of the household of King Hezekiah. In other words, this was the guy in charge of the whole palace in Jerusalem. Wow. And now we found his personal seal. So then in 2009, again, going back in time, a seal was found. Two seals were found in Jerusalem. We've talked maybe a little bit about this before in another program, but two seals were found. And in, on those seals found in the city of David, uh, actually in the Ophel, a little bit further to the uh, north, um, more along towards the Temple Mount area. They are 10 feet apart from each other, the seal impression of King Hezekiah, and right next to it, the seal impression, ten, less than 10 feet away, less than three meters away, just over three meters away, was the seal impression of an Isaiah, the Navi, or I shouldn't say the, uh, uh, Isaiah Navi. Navi is the Hebrew word for prophet. Now there's a letter missing, which causes a little bit of a question mark. The Aleph is missing at the end, but this could in fact, the excavator Elat Mazar suggested that it could in fact be the prophet Isaiah. And if that's the case, we have here a clear connection between these two contemporaries. And if you go back to Isaiah 37, all three of the people that are mentioned, there's four people mentioned, three of them now have been found on seal impressions. Another one, Shebna the scribe, is also been found in one of the inscriptions in Jerusalem. So we have all four of those. That makes it very exciting when you can reconnect with an ancient person that lived. It's almost when you find one of these seal impressions like your, this was the personal signature of an oh, individual. Yeah. So it's like reaching back and shaking yeah. somebody's hand almost. Oh, wow. Very exciting. It doesn't, doesn't that have to grow your faith in the Bible? As a, as a living, valid Absolutely. historical document. It just Absolutely. does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it does. I mean, we have, I'm, I'm writing a book right now where we have documented, over the course of 200 years of archaeological research, we've documented 
over 100 people of the Bible. Some of these are very famous people that one would expect, like King Sennacherib or Nebuchadnezzar or Hezekiah. Others are obscure people like Nebuchadnezzar, an official that's just mentioned in passing in one verse of the Bible. But isn't that just as interesting, really, that you can validate an obscure figure from the Bible? Absolutely. That's got to be very strengthening for a person's faith as It is. Well. It is. Because, you know, what's the likelihood? It's like you said, the, the needle in the proverbial haystack. Yeah. What's the likelihood of finding that many people and and we have you know in the book of jeremiah for example in the city of david excavations we have several of these seal impressions that have been uncovered and those seal impressions are are listed these officials that jeremiah actually goes in when he goes in and reads the scroll to the king you know those officials that are standing there with the king the nobles we've found their seal impressions that are mentioned in in jeremiah and they, they were there in the palace so why, do you, so why do you think those seal impressions were found? I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you my idea and tell me what you think. It seems to me, it seems to me finding a seal impression is I mean, a bazillion to one. A very small, why they would stand the test of, why, why they would still exist, I don't know. Um, doesn't it seem to you, 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 you must have had this experience again and again, doesn't it seem to you that this is God saying, I want you to find this. I want you to under, I want you to be able to say to the world, look, Isaiah, Hezekiah, I want these things to be seen. Don't you ever feel like in archaeology, God is on the sidelines or out there in the field with you, cheering you on, hoping or maybe orchestrating that certain things will be uncovered at certain times? I think, I think there's an element of that. Um, I don't always think that it's chance. Many times it, it, it is. My, my colleague, who I've worked with for many years, says it's not chance. We, we are very strategic in where we go to excavate, where we are likely to find the best things. We are very strategic once we get to a site, where to, where to go, where we think the, the best uh, kind of discoveries are to be made. And yet there's still that risk involved that you could excavate for a whole season or two seasons and really not find anything significant. Right. Um, but yes, I think... I think there definitely is. And you know, when Isaiah's seal was uncovered, my, my friend in Florida texted me that day and, and said, have you seen the article? And I immediately renewed my subscription to the journal and, and, and saw the article right there on the spot. And it, it, it sent goosebumps because this is the largest Old Testament prophetic book that we have, right. 66 chapters yeah. of Isaiah. It's been doubted by skeptics for years that Isaiah actually, um, you know, the, the book has been divided into three parts, uh, Deutero-Isaiah, Trito-Isaiah, in order to obscure the prophetic nature of the book. Um, because if Isaiah is living at the time of Hezekiah and is predicting Cyrus the Great, who is going to be taking over, this is a problem. Yeah. Look, I want to ask problem. you about some of, the, some of the fun things that archaeologists are, are hoping to find. What's, what's the dream inside the mind of, of archaeologists, if we could uncover this? And... A couple of other things I'd like to ask you about in a moment as well. With Dr. Michael Hazel, I'm John Bradshaw. This is our conversation brought to you by It Is Written. We'll be right back. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God, and here it is. It is written dot study. Go online to it is written dot study and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides, 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you, and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written online Bible study guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, itiswritten.study. Itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is archaeologist Dr. Michael Hazel. I'm going to ask you in a moment about 
the dreamer inside every archaeologist that that must exist uh, where he or she in the field is is hoping that man if we could only but i want to ask you this question i have you comment on this first um there's a phenomenal story from your own personal experience where you miraculously survived death, certain death, miraculously. I'd love you to tell me that story if you would. Well, I was a student in Europe for a year at a small school in Austria. And um, my father called me one day and said, uh, I was 20 years old, said, you uh, would like to join us maybe sometime uh, we're going to Florida again. We were living in Michigan, so Florida was always a nice place to go during the wintertime. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's all where all the snowbirds go, oh, right? Yeah. So it was our tradition to go camping on one of the keys, Key Largo. And um, we would usually get together with a large group of relatives. And that year, I think 40 of our, my relatives were going to be down there. We would spend two weeks playing beach volleyball, going snorkeling, scuba diving. I was heavy into windsurfing back then, and so we'd always have, my cousins were too, so we always had several windsurfers and a Hobie cat. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. And on this particular occasion, um, I was in Europe that year, and so my dad says, uh, have you thought, would you like to come over and visit us in, in Florida? And I said, well, I was kind of thinking about staying here. Well, it's running. we're running out of time. I, I'm going to call you back in three hours. I want you to make a decision. You're an adult now. I want, it's your decision to make, but I'm going to check at the travel agency to see if there's any openings at all for you to come over. And I'll call you back 3 o'clock your time. I'll call you back, and uh, you need to be making a decision by that time. So I, I went out. Um, I was at lunch at the time. I went to my cousin's room after that, Bettina's room. She was a student there in the high school. And uh, I told her about the phone call and she says, well, have you prayed about this decision at all? I felt a little guilty, honestly, because she was a high school student. I was a theology student. I hadn't really thought about praying about it. So I was like, uh, well, it's a kind of a simple decision. She says, well, let's, let's just kneel down and pray about it here. So her roommate, Katrina, and my cousin, Bettina, and myself, we knelt down and we prayed got up and I had arranged already that day to take them into town for some shopping and the whole time they were shopping I was thinking about what my decision would be and I have to tell you John I didn't have a clear answer it wasn't like there was handwriting on the wall there wasn't lightning there wasn't a voice there was nothing like that so and this should have been the easiest decision you ever made you, yeah. you're in Europe for a year you're away from your family dad calls 40 of your family yeah. are going to have fun in Florida. That's right. That's right. I mean, yes. That's right. That's right. But it, but it didn't turn out that way. But the more I can tell you how the afternoon went, the more I thought about staying, the more I thought about going home to, Mich to, uh, to Florida, the more uncomfortable I felt, the lack of peace. The more I felt about staying, the more I thought about staying, as I thought about staying, I felt a sense of peace. That's the best way I can describe it. Sure. And finally, uh, 15 minutes before the phone call, we were back at, at, at the school and I had made my decision. I was going to stay. My dad calls right on time. Before I could get in words edgewise, he's like, Michael, I'm so excited. I just got back from Ruth. That's the name of our travel agent. Got back from Ruth's. She has gotten a seat for you. It was uh, almost the last seat on the plane, he says, but you're going to be flying from Frankfurt to London, London to New York, New York to Miami. We'll pick you up in Miami. Everything's been arranged. The flight's booked, uh, at least temporarily. I've got a seat for you. And the, 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 the other issue that I didn't mention was it had been a miserable fall. Oh, yeah. It was raining constantly. It was kind of this drizzle, wet cold that penetrates your bones no matter what you're wearing. And I looked outside and it was, it was drizzling again. I mean, it was just a miserable... I, I could count on one hand how many times I'd seen the sun between mm. September and, and November when this call was taking place. And so at that point, um, I, I said, well, but Dad, I... My resolve, in other words, was fading fast. But then I said, Dad, I, I've been praying about it all afternoon and I've kind of decided I think I should stay. There's this long silence on the phone. My dad, first thing he said was, your mother will be very disappointed. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was oh. like, oh, that's <laughs> not good. And then he says, but it's your decision. 
If you change your mind, he said, the booking is going to hold for 72 hours. Wow. If you change your mind, call me back. We'll get the ticket. And by the way, your mother and I have decided we're paying for the ticket. You oh, don't have to worry about on. the ticket. Well, So I, I said, okay. He says, but um, I understand. And, and it's your decision. That's what we had agreed upon. And uh, we talked about a few other things. That was it. Two weeks went by. Didn't, didn't call back. Two weeks went by. I'm driving now to my uncle's house, who's a pastor in southern Germany. And to spend Christmas with Bettina and with the family. And while we were opening presents around the tree, um, my father calls from Florida. And he says, Michael, he said, um, I want you to talk to some of the relatives. And it, I can imagine exactly where that pay, pay phone was because I was there many times. And I, I think all the relatives were lined up. And that was a very expensive call, one after the other. Finally, my dad gets on the back on the phone. And he says, I'm really glad you didn't come. And I'm like, why? Don't you miss me? I kind yeah, of looked at yeah, the phone, yeah. you know. And he's like, no. He says, I had you booked on Pan Am Flight 103 that crashed in Lockerbie, Scotland last week. And I, the tree just blurred in front of me. I, I literally just handed the phone to my uncle as that kind of began to sink in. I had been listening on the drive from the school up to Germany. All the newscasts about that crash, never making the connection at all. And realizing, you know, 189 people on that flight died, additional people in the, in the, in the city and of Lockerbie. And I just couldn't wrap my mind around that. I was like, what, what's going on here? You were booked on that flight. Right. Right. It was almost impossible for you to not be on that flight. You're booked. We are paying. Your mother wants to see you. 40 family members. Fun in the Florida sun. In the winter, you've had a miserable fall. Who could say no? And yet you did. And that was God's leading. I think so. You know, I've, I've wrestled with it. I dealt with all kinds of feelings of survivor guilt. You I wondered know, for about a while. that. Yeah, you, you do. I mean, yeah. there, were, there, were, there was a whole group of students my age from Syracuse students. University that yep. were on that flight, flying back students. home. and. Why, why did I survive? I mean, and I don't have the answer to that completely, no. but I, I do keep thinking back to that, that, that the three of us kneeling in that dormitory room and praying about it and the sense of direction that I felt that afternoon as I, as I was thinking and praying about it before that decision. So that was a monumental event in my life that caused me to rethink everything. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I read a little book after, after that experience that summer I read the great controversy for the first time and and I had a I had a new conversion experience in my life that that I hadn't had before and it was partly due to that experience I've been to the Lockerbie Memorial and knowing this story I looked for your name and uh, thank God it's not there yeah. yeah that's God intervening in your life in a profound way yeah profound way yeah. And he does that in our lives. Yeah, he does. He does that. And, and sometimes we all have we stories know to tell. Sometimes we know sometimes about it. Sometimes we know. Sometimes we have no idea. I have a friend whose grandmother raced to Southampton from Norway, I believe. And she was so disappointed. She didn't quite get there in time to get on the Titanic. Mm. Yeah. Mm. True story. Yeah. Absolutely true story. You hear those stories from time to time. That's right. And they are dramatic. Well, I, it, it's got to be very difficult for you to look at your life now and not see that God has a very real purpose after something like that. I mean, God's mercies are new every morning. Every day we need to be able to say, God has a purpose for me today. But to see that God has a very special purpose for your life. So now, as an archaeologist, you, you, you don't sift in the sand uh, merely for the fun of it, uh, for the two breakfasts and the watermelon break. Uh, no. You are hoping to find the inscriptions that say, King David, you, you, I mean, of course you are. What archaeologists would not? This has got to vary from discipline to discipline. You know, Neo Babylonian architecture, uh, sorry, archaeology, or, 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 or British Viking, some other thing, North American. What are archaeologists hanging out hoping to find? Mm. I mean, I know it's not all treasure hunting, but you did mention earlier there's a little treasure hunter inside of everybody. And, it, and, and maybe it varies from place to place. If you are digging in yeah. southern Israel, then you're not hoping to find the tomb of, 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 of some Egyptian uh, pharaoh. Yeah. 
But what are, what are those things that, that you love to find or the certain things that you say, this would blow things wide open? I was asked that question one time by one of the leading archaeologists in Israel, Professor Amnon ben Tor from the Hebrew University. We were having dinner together at the American Colony Hotel and uh, our university president and a number of our board members were on that trip and uh, he asked that question. He says, what do you think would be the most incredible find of the century? Mm. Well, when Isaiah's seal was found, I thought that probably was one of the greatest. But uh, so I'll tell you what Professor Ben Tour said. If you had the choice between this or this, and the, one of these was an archive, a huge archive of texts, maybe, you know, that, like the ones that were found at Ebla or Ugarit or Mari or some of these places or Babylon, would that be it? Or would it be, he says, a monumental inscription from the time of Solomon mentioning his name. And I hesitated because I was like, I, I don't know. I mean, he, he's, he's the, the ranking Israeli archaeologist was at that time. And, and so I hesitated. He says, why are you hesitating? It's Solomon, of course. And I said, really? I said, why is that? And he says, because it would take decades far beyond our lifetimes to go through all these the, at the archive of thousands of texts sure it would be solomon it would be the the ultimate payback for all the work that that has gone into something so that was that was his answer that's and an I, think, interesting answer. I think that's a good answer because yeah. solomon of course you know david's son uh is is it, ruled during the golden age of israel's history and we don't have a mention of him in the archaeological nothing, record yet nothing yet. just like we don't have didn't have david a few uh, decades ago so that would be that would be amazing um but really other than those really exciting finds that happen every few years every decade or so um it, it is also the bigger pictures of 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 reconstructing the past you know finding a kirbet kayafa that dates to the time of david finding a Kirbet el Rai that dates to the same time period. And as you look over a decade of archaeology and you're able to say, I was involved in this project, in this project, in this project, in this project, and these three or four sites have now redefined really the discipline in terms of that early history of Judah, that's, that's a lifetime's accomplishment yeah. right there. So I, I look back at it and I say, I've, I've done... I've been fortunate, I'm, and I'm humbled to say this, but I've been fortunate to be in the right places at the right time when these things happen. I think maybe, you know, that was also divine providence. Sure. But God, God put us in places where we were able to make very significant discoveries. Can't wait to find what this ivory comb says on it. Yeah. That may be another groundbreaking thing. Who right. Knows? And I, I know my question belies my, my ignorance. Um, it would appear that the overall impetus or heft or power of archaeology isn't really built on the one piece here or the one Correct. piece here, but it's built on this vast collection of the mundane, which when put together creates pictures or uh, reconstructs civilizations or redefines your understanding of certain time periods and shines a bright light on the Bible. That's exactly right. And, and when you think about it, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of these giants that have come before us that have built up incrementally this vast database of information. And as a scientist in your short career of 30 or 40 years, I mean, you're just able to add a little tiny bit on top of that. And that gives us a little insight also into some of the deconstruction and some of the critical thinking that goes on today. It's much easier to deconstruct what others have done and to argue against something right. that has been found or that a conclusion that has been made. That, that can be done very quickly and make headlines. But to add scientifically to the data and to provide additional information and data that may redefine or may add to that corpus of material that takes a lifetime of work and takes a long time to do. And so, yeah, you, you kind of look at those things and, and, and we're fortunate, we've been fortunate to, to be able to work in a fairly secure country. Israel has not had, a, you know, there's, there's always some issues going on in the Middle East, but overall it's been a very safe place to work, very, uh, very solid place. I have colleagues who 
invested their careers in Syria and other places, and they just haven't been able to work there. Of right. course, with the pandemic now, nobody is working pretty much. So we'll yeah. see how long that lasts. Yeah, difficult. Hopefully not long. Right. Hey, we don't have much time, but I, I, I cannot let the conversation go by without asking you about the museum. Tell me about the museum. You've, you've put a lot of work into the museum, the Lynn H. Wood Archaeological Museum on the campus of Southern Adventist University in Collegedale, Tennessee. So what's happening there, and, and what do we look forward to there? Well, uh, we have an exhibit currently, right now, that is going to be up until May. It's a, it's a special exhibit. We have, a, of course, a permanent exhibit that focuses on the whole history of, of uh, the ancient Near East from the earliest times all the way through to the uh, Roman and even Islamic periods. But then we have special exhibits, and right now we have a special exhibit on the history of the Bible and the development of the Bible, which is fascinating. We have some of the rarest Bibles on exhibit. They're on loan, and they're only going to be there till the end of uh, this semester, till, till May. Um, after that, we have just voted as a board to uh, actually focus on Lachish and bring in an exhibit from Israel focusing on our excavations at Lachish and actually nice. having the artifacts here, like that seal of uh, Eliakim cool. and some of those other things that we have discovered there, and have it, and it's a great, great, idea because really we can talk about two major events that happened in biblical history at Lachish. One is the uh, famous Assyrian uh, campaign and what was happening before that. And then one, of course, is the great Nebuchadnezzar Babylonian campaign where the temple was eventually destroyed in Jerusalem. And both of those, we have a great deal of information to talk about. At, at that site. Is it a good time to be an archaeologist? I mean, the, the societal challenges notwithstanding, or is it always a good time to be an archaeologist? It's a challenging field. You know, you have to go through an education equivalent to becoming a neurosurgeon, and then you have to be working overseas and, and those kinds of things. But the benefits and the outcomes, the excitement of the discovery, and then how to use those to enhance people's understanding of the Bible, to see people's lives changed as they hear those encouraging, faith-affirming uh, experiences, that is what makes it uh, incredible. And to see the students just get excited about these things when they're in the field, um, to see those aha moments when those discoveries, when they're making them for the first time themselves, um, those are those are incredible moments. And my hope now in the last years of my career is are to focus on popular things that uh, popular programs that can bring all of these discoveries to the light of people. Well, I want to thank you for what you're doing, because thank whether you. we realize it or not, people like me owe an enormous debt to archaeologists for shining a bright light onto the word of God, making our job as ministers of the gospel easier because we have uh, more to validate what we say. It's a wonderful field, tremendously exciting, and thank you. Thanks for taking your time with me today. It's great to be it. with you. Thank you yeah, so much. What a joy. Truly a blessing, and I trust it has been for you as well. Thanks so much for being part of this. An archaeologist, a teacher, a minister of the gospel, he is Dr. Michael Hazel. I'm John Bradshaw. This has been our conversation. Mm -hmm.